Hello and welcome to this uh, next lecture on pattern recognition. Uh, last class uh, we have been discussing uh, issues about assessing uh, classifiers or regression function models in general any model that we learn from data and we looked at some very generic issues of uh, uh, which are which are independent of any learning algorithm for example no free lunch theorem and so on we tell you that uh, uh, there is no such thing as the best classifier learning algorithm. Essentially, each algorithm, if it does well on certain kinds of pattern classification problems, it has to do badly on certain other classification problems. So, every algorithm has its own niche applications, and uh, that is nice. We also looked at this so called bias variance trade off uh, in um, uh, getting a good model estimated from data, and uh, after that. We, we were looking at in practice how does one assess learned models right. Apart from all the theoretical issues somebody gives you some data and uh, uh, we have to uh, learn a model from it a classifier regression function whatever and then uh, we have to ultimately decide uh, whether what you learnt is good enough what kind of estimate is directly uh, likely to give. As you also see in uh, learning a model involves two steps a model selection and a model estimation right. So, essentially uh, we need to use the training data for uh, model estimation, model selection and model assessment right. What does that mean? We have to first choose a class of models right. A class of models would mean uh, uh, all the parameters of the model should be uh, fixed. So, Neural networks is not a class of models, but neural networks with a single hidden layer with five hidden nodes is a class of models. Right? So, we have to first choose the model parameters. Similarly, a Gaussian kernel with uh, sigma is equal to uh, uh, 10 is a specific model class. <laughs> and to select a suitable model class and then within that model class, we have to learn a specific model. That is what we have uh, the, all the algorithms we have been considering so far are uh, uh, given some training data. How do we learn a particular model from the class of models that we have decided to <laughs> learn from? And then we also have to assess how good the final learned model will perform. Right? So, the idea of model assessment is that we need to use the training data not only for model estimation, meaning all the learning algorithm that we have been discussing throughout the course, but also for selecting suitable model class and also for uh, estimating the uh, uh, true risk or the final error that the land model is likely to have. Right? And the reason why uh, this is a, a, an interesting or difficult problem is that the training error is not a good indicator of the suitability of the land model. <laughs> Obviously, because uh, all our algorithms are designed to minimize the training error. So, whatever idiosyncrasies or noise is there in our training data, our algorithms uh, uh, try to tune for that and hence uh, we may get a very low training error. But that does not necessarily mean we will do well on unseen patterns. Right? So, essentially when the model complexity is large, it is possible that we can get very low training error, but the test error that is error on new unseen data would be large. Right? So, this is the basic issue. Okay? Uh, we actually seen last class, but this uh, graph is worth seeing many times. This is a very important graph for uh, models uh, uh, assessment. Essentially, the training and test errors behave like this. For, for a given number of examples, as I am increasing the model complexity, model complexity is along x axis and uh, error is on the y axis. So, the red is the training error. So, as I am increasing the uh, model complexity at the same number of examples, because more and more complicated models are there, so I can certainly fit some model or the other better to the data. So, my training error keeps coming down, but my test error initially when model complexity is very small uh, because of very high bias, I get high test error, but if I make my model complexity very large, once again because of high variance now, I get high test error. So, somewhere in the middle, I have the best um, bias variance trade off and uh, that is what I, 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 I need to uh, get at. So, for example, if you think of uh, this as a least squares 
uh, fitting of a polynomial uh, and model complexity will be the degree of the polynomial. As we know as we keep increasing the degree of the polynomial for a given number of examples, uh, I can reduce my training error as, as small as I want eventually make it 0. But if I have 100 data samples and I fit a 100 degree polynomial, obviously even though my training error is 0, uh, I am not going to say that this particular polynomial is what the data is generated from. Right? So, the, the issue is that we need to select the model with the right complexity. Right? Of course, we do not know which is the right complexity model, but certainly just going by training error does not help us. Okay. So, this we knew when we studied uh, from our discussion on statistical learning theory. The error on training set is the empirical risk and it is not necessarily close to the true risk, which is the expected error on uh, newer test data. Right? We saw that empirical risk will be close to true risk. Uh, only when you have large number of examples, large is relative to the model complexity, the VC dimension. Right? So, otherwise and uh, in general at any given uh, number of examples, if we increase the complexity, uh, the examples will become small relative to the complexity. If the model class has very, uh, is very complex, then we will overfit. Overfitting means we are essentially getting low training error, but large test error. It is like we have, uh, uh, it is like we have um, um, it is like we have um, uh, fitting a 100 degree polynomial to 100 points, right. It is war fitting because we get 0 training error, but it is not certainly uh, a, a very good fit, right. So, this kind of war fitting is what we want to avoid. We need to use the training data for selecting a suitable model class, that is model selection estimating or learning a specific model from that class and also to get the final uh, land model. right? As we briefly mentioned last time, if we have sufficient data, this can be done fairly easily. Okay? If, you, if data is no problem, then all this all this is uh, not really problematic. right? What is the overall plan? If we have enough data, then whatever data we have, we split into three parts, a training set, a validation set and a test set. The training set is what to use like the training sets in all algorithms that we repeatedly use the training set to learn a specific model from a chosen class of models. So, if I have chosen a, a neural networks with one hidden layer, five hidden nodes, then we use the training set uh, and a back propagation algorithm to learn the weights, right. Or if I have chosen a uh, SVM with a, a polynomial kernel with uh, <coughs> uh, p is equal to 3, then for that model class, we can of course use and un, a particular value of c. Then we'll, we will uh, we will then use the SMO algorithm, for example, with the training set to learn a specific sphere. Right? So, for a specific model class, uh, uh, we use our training set to learn a specific model. What do we mean by repeatedly? What we are doing is we are using validation set to select good models. So, let us say I want to know what is a good c to use in my SVM algorithm. So, I will fix some value of c, use the training set to get my SVM, then I measure the error of that SVM on the validation set. Now, I choose some other value of c, once again use the training set to learn an SVM, measure the uh, error of this SVM also using the validation set. So, I use the validation set to compare different models, that is how you do model selection. And finally, after doing a particular model, after fixing my value of c and other parameters of the kernel in the SVM, I will learn my final SVM and to, to get an idea of what it what its error uh, rate is likely to be, I use the test set. right? So, essentially test set is not used till I come to the final uh, classifier and they say test set should be logged up in a vault. So, then because this is certainly new random data which are not seen in anything so far, right? then it is likely to give me the a good estimate of the true risk. See for example, if I use the validation set to assess the um, utility of the final land model, it would not be good because I chose that particular model class only because on the validation set that particular model class is giving me low error. So, I am likely to think that what I learned is very good even though it may not be that good. So, that is the reason I need also a separate test set. So, basically if I have enough data, 
I repeatedly use the training set to learn specific models from a chosen model class. I compare different model classes for model selection using validation set. And finally, I use the test set to find the expected error of the final learned model. So, validation set is used to find the error rate of the classifier on different model classes. Uh, may be indexed by a parameter alpha, alpha could be for example, C of SVM. Okay. So, mm. and then uh, uh, after choosing a particular model class and finally, learning it, I use the test set to find its final error. Okay. A rough rule of thumb is you use about 50 percent data for training, 25 percent data for validation, 20 percent data for test. Okay. So, if you have 1000 samples, use 500 for training, 250 for validation, 250 for test. Um, what part to use for validation, which 250 pa, uh, for validation, which 250 for test, which 500 for training. Right? Well, normally, because you do not want any biases creeping in, we will do this in a random fashion. You split the data randomly into three parts uh, with this uh, in this proportion and then uh, uh, use one for training, one for validation, one for test. Very often one goes through this several times, several random divisions like this and do this just to see that uh, the final classifier land does not change too much. Okay? If the final classifier land does not change too much, that means uh, overall the learning is quite robust and that will also give me sufficient confidence that whatever land is correct. So, instead of just doing one split of training validation test, one does many random splits of data like this and on each of them you do the same process and compare the final land models to see if they are vastly different from one another. If they are, then maybe I am not learning well. If they are sufficiently robust, then it is fine. So, essentially, if we have sufficient data, this is what we can do. Right? What, what do we mean sufficient data? See, what we have just now uh, advocated is that 50 percent of the data should be set aside for validation and testing, which means when I use my SVM algorithm or backpropagation algorithm or linear least case algorithm, what have you, I am only using 50 percent of the data. That means, we are using only 50 percent of the training samples to actually learn a classifier. Now, this can restrict the complexity of the model we can learn. So, if I have 1000 samples, I may be able to learn neural networks with 20 hidden nodes, but because I have to learn only from 500 samples. I can learn only with 10 hidden nodes for example, of course, things are not so linear, but in general, if the number of uh, training samples is less, it restricts the complexity of model we can learn from. Now, this does not matter if I can get uh, training samples at will, right. In synthetic problems, I can get as many training samples as I want because training samples are simply simulated. Right. In some, uh, some kinds of uh, problems, for example, if I want uh, uh, web pages, uh, possibly I can think I can get as many web pages as, as I want by uh, crawling on the on the net if web pages are my pattern. But in many many applications, data is not easily obtained. Okay. So, obtaining data is a costly process and then finding a classification uh, uh, my uh, in the training data every data should have its uh, true classifier true quote unquote uh, uh, classification label should be there because you have to give data x i and y i. So, I have to obtain the data x i and then classify it. Both are costly. Obtaining data could be costly, also correctly classifying it could be costly. Right. So, when data size is small, uh, we are we are uh, we are rather thrifty and we do not want to permanently set aside uh, uh, data for other purposes. We may want to use all the data for training, right. Only then we can learn a model of sufficient complexity. So, when data size is small, <coughs> uh, doing what we advocated, having uh, 50 percent for training, 25 percent for validation, 25 percent for test may not be feasible. Okay. Okay. Let us just uh, put, uh, formalize all this, so that we know what we are talking about. Uh, as earlier, let us say x 1, y 1, x n, y n is the training that <coughs> set. Let us say f hat is the model that we learnt and l is the usual loss function. Um, then what is the training error? Training error, I will call it E train is 1 by n uh, summation i is equal to 1 to n L of f hat x i y. Right? This is your em, uh, emp uh, empirical risk. This is the training error we have been considering in all our learning algorithms. Right? And when we want to do model selection, obviously, there will be uh, we have to also index dif uh, different model classes. 
So, we will represent uh, it as f hat alpha, where alpha is a parameter that denotes the model class. So, for example, number of hidden nodes or the value of c or whatever. So, when we when we are doing model selection and hence have to compare uh, different model classes, this f hat may have a further subscript alpha. Now, the test error that we are interested in is the true risk. I call it E test, which is the actual expectation of the loss function, right. This, this is the true risk that we are interested in. When we have separate test data, we can easily estimate it as the sample mean from the test data, right. This is an expectation. If I separate test data, I will simply estimate it as L f hat x i y i summation over i uh, 1 by the number of samples, where the summation is over all the test data, right. Now, whether it is test or validation it is the same. In both cases, I want to estimate this one for different alpha, one for the final f hat, but essentially we want to estimate this expectation as a sample mean on separate data. That is what I am saying is, suppose we want to assess a model class which is specified by parameter alpha, as I said alpha could be value of C and SVM, number of hidden nodes and neural network and so on. So, if a particular alpha, uh, we choose that model class use our training data set to learn the right model, let us say that is f hat alpha. Then to assess that model class on the validation set, I do L of f hat alpha x x y i summed over i. The summation is not over your training data, but over the validation data. So, if there are n v validation data points, there will be 1 by n v of the summation. Similarly, if I am doing uh, test error, I do the same thing on the test. So, essentially, the, the the actual test error is a true expectation, which I can certainly use uh, approximate as a sample mean if I have separate data, right. That is what we have been saying. Only if I do not have separate data, then taking the training error as test error is not right, because the f hat is specifically chosen to make the training error small, okay. So, essentially I can do this, I can estimate the true risk as a sample mean like that. If I have sufficient data, then we can do model assessment, model selection, everything like this. When the amount of data is small, my problem is keeping it, keeping a part of it aside permanently for validation and testing. I do not want to do that. What can I do? So, we need some methods which can estimate the test error without having to permanently lock up data, uh, part of the data. I want to use all data for learning, but at the same time, I somehow want to estimate these test errors more accurately. Okay. So, let us first start by looking at what is called an in sample error. Okay. This gives you some theoretical ideas of what the problem is about. The in sample error is the following. See, we have a training data x i y i. Right? So, let us assume that for the same x i, we get one more measurement of y i. Normally, a lot of uh, times is the y i noise uh, that is really the noise in the training data. So, uh, let us say uh, theoretically let us for, for, for question of pattern recognition context what it means is I take the same x i go to some other expert and ask him to classify right or if I am actually measuring some value of uh, some function uh, experimentally I set my um, data to x i again and re measure y i and so on let us call that y i new. So, on the same x i we get new y i new and so this is a kind of in sample training data x i's are same, but y i's are once again obtained randomly using the same underlying distribution. And then we define what is called the in sample error, which is L f hat x i y i by i new. This I take expectation with respect to the y new random variable with respect to which this y i new's are obtained. See x i's are fixed, so there is nothing random in x i. Right. That is why I am averaging over x i, but x i's are fixed, but y i nu is random. So, I take an expectation over y nu and I also have to take expectation over y because the f hat that I have learned is a function of the old y i's. Right. I have learned f hat using x i y i. So, f hat is a function of the old y i's. So, this expectation averages out the f hat I could have learned if I got some random data and then having learned from there this y this expectation tells me how I would have performed if the same x i, but different measurement noise was involved. Okay. Um, very often if we think the 
the prediction variable is related to our uh, uh, our uh, measurement vector or feature vector x by a deterministic function f x plus noise. Then uh, a good way of assessing how well we learn is to just ask at the same axis if I take a new measurement how well uh, my prediction uh, predict the new measurement. This will tell me whether I am predicting the, 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 the deterministic part or unnecessarily uh, modeling the stochastic variation in the original y i using which I have learnt f hat. Okay? That is why we want to define the in sample error both as the expectation with respect to y nu and expectation with respect to y. Okay? Now, we define what is a quantity called optimism as the in sample error minus the training error. See, essentially the in sample error would be higher than the training error. Training error chooses an f hat, uh, we choose an f hat to minimize the training error. The same f hat on new measurements will not do very well, right? will not will not do as well, I mean, do ok, but will not do just as well. And because this average or all first measurements, one expects in sample error to be higher than the training error. Now, essentially uh, if it is small, then it is all right. So, we call this the optimism in sample error minus the training error. So, if we can somehow estimate this OP, then I can get uh, at least a connection between the training error and in sample error in as much as in sample error is average over all possible measurement noise. Right? Uh, if I can estimate that for my model, uh, that itself gives me some uh, some good sense of uh, how well my model will perform in general. Right? So, estimating the optimism is a method of getting more accurate error estimates. Um, if we think of fitting a linear model with d parameters and we assume that the relationship between y and x is f is equal to y is equal to f of x plus epsilon where epsilon is a 0 mean independent noise. This is the standard linear least squares statistical model. Then one can show that the in sample error is the expectation of the training error plus 2 into d by n times sigma square epsilon. d is the number of parameters in the model, n is the number of data, sigma square epsilon is the uh, variance of the noise. Okay. Noise is 0 mean. <coughs> okay. um, so, this uh, this can be shown uh, for, for linear model learning. So, this gives us some, some interesting ways of doing model selection. Right? So, we can use estimates like this for doing model selection without needing separate validation data. Uh, there are many criteria uh, uh, the call AKK information criterion, wage information criteria and so on, uh, which are as, which essentially use such calculations to do a model selection without needing a validation data for model. Okay. Uh, this give good estimates in case of models that are essentially linear parameters. Most of this work for linear models. Uh, as we have seen already, linear models are essentially linear parameters. So, the uh, and we, we, as we saw when we learnt linear models, uh, the most often used uh, um, loss functions are uh, the logistic loss function or the squared error loss. So, all these estimates are for linear models under squared error loss or for logistic regression. Okay. So, we will we will just look at one uh, uh, one example of how one does that kind of model selection. So, let us say um, um, our model class is indexed by parameter alpha. So, I want to learn the right value of alpha to select a model class. We are in we are in a model selection. So, what as I said alpha could be the number of hidden nodes, uh, alpha could be uh, C value as a matter of fact alpha could be not just as one parameter it could be a vector uh, parameter. So, alpha could consist of the C value as well as uh, the parameters of the kernel function in an SVM. Right? So, alpha could be a, a, a pair an ordered a pair uh, C comma uh, let us say P, P is the degree of the polynomial kernel. So, different values of alpha specify different model classes and I want to know which model class to choose. In, within each model class, I can find the training error because I have a training set. So, let us say E train alpha, uh, E train is a function of alpha is the training error of the model I have learnt in the model class alpha and let us say D of alpha denote the number of parameters 
to specify as model in uh, in the class alpha okay because we are considering only linear models essentially as uh, um, for linear class alpha is not like cf and svm for linear class alpha is simply equal to uh, the 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 number of parameters you use the step size you use in the algorithm and things like that so let's say d alpha you know the uh, uh, the number of parameters in the model class alpha then we define aic alpha as e train alpha this is the training error plus 2 d alpha by n sigma square epsilon so essentially i'm saying this is a good model complexity term as you already know the true error or true risk is empirical risk plus a model complexity term in as much as my uh, optimism estimate is given by this right uh, we are saying in sample error is e train plus this so optimism estimate is this so this is a good estimate of the model complexity so we define aic alpha as train uh, train alpha plus 2 times d alpha by n to sigma square epsilon. of course you nobody gives you sigma square epsilon either you assume some uh, noise variance model or you make maybe a few multiple measurements and estimate as a noise variance to make multiple measurements i don't have to measure why i for each of the xi in as much as i assume noise is independent at one xi if i measure many why i many times and find the variance that variance i can use here okay so the idea of this is that now i i minimize aic alpha rather than e train alpha. normally when i'm doing a learning algorithm i'm only minimizing training error now instead of minimizing training error i minimize this complicated thing right i want to so it's like i'm not choosing a particular model so i i minimize this over alpha of course in general uh, alpha is a discrete parameter so one can't minimize this so but what it means is i choose different values of alpha right and then on each alpha i find the training error and then calculate this so the the sum is the true reflection of that model class just because training error is small doesn't mean that the model class is good because for example d alpha may be large right and that's what we seen earlier uh, how the model complex come so these are these are criteria for properly assessing the model complexity so i can use this comp uh, compound thing for uh, choosing a model i i can evaluate this for a few alpha and choose the best alpha what have i gained compared to what i'm doing earlier i don't need a validation set now right because i don't need a separate validation error i'm using this esti estimate of optimism right to to decide the model complexity term so i can use all the data i have for training i don't need extra validation data okay so this this is how for example i can do model selection this is one uh, this call akk information criteria this is one way of doing model selection cuz in general in sample error may not be the appropriate estimate because uh, that is uh, the error that my land model will incur if i have the same xi but do re -measure, uh, measurement for yi apart from that we may not be able to get this kind of estimates in general and uh, that particular estimate we given is for linear models under squared error logistic regression uh, kind of loss function so in general getting these estimates is also not easy for nonlinear models so what we actually need is some way to reliably estimate the test error the true risk of a given model using the same thing as the training data of course i use the training data to learn a fat but somehow i want to get the true risk of a fat somehow from the training data itself that is what we want to do okay <coughs> now uh, in the uh, from our discussion on uh, statistical learning theory uh, there are a few other possibilities one can think of of doing this for example the the test error is the true risk of a fat and uh, in the vc theory we seen that the true risk of any model can be bounded above by the empirical risk under term and that term involves only vc dimension n and the training error so given the training error 
I can certainly get a bound on the true risk of any model. Okay. So, if I have learnt f hat from some training data and I know the training error f hat, then knowing the VC dimension of that class, that model class, the number of examples and the training error, I can get a bound on e test. We have we, we've seen such expressions when we did our, uh, when we discussed statistical learning theory. Uh, in practice, uh, these bounds may not be very useful for two reasons. As we saw when we derived these bounds, that these bounds are very loose. They are often use the so called union bound, which essentially uh, bounds the probability of union of sets by the sum of the sets that itself is those bound. There are many other steps like that in the derivation uh, because of which uh, the bounds are loose. The second reason, second problem with these bonds is we need to know the VC dimension of the model class. If you recall, uh, we had almost more than half a class of derivation to get the VC dimension of uh, linear classifiers in order. So, in general, when we have <coughs> a specific model class, finding the VC dimension uh, may not be uh, uh, that that easy. For example, for even neural network models, one has only an estimate on VC dimension, right? an upper bound on VC dimension. So, if you are using an upper bound on VC dimension and then an upper bound on the uh, test, both of which are loose, ultimately the bound we get on the test error may be loose. So, by loose what it means is that uh, uh, the, the, the true test error may be much smaller than the bound we get, but we unnecessarily think that our test error is very high. So, in practice, this may not be very useful. So, what we need are techniques, statistical empirical techniques that allow me to estimate the true risk or the test error using some of the training data. Okay. So, we will we'll start with one of the most popularly used such techniques which is called cross validation. Cross validation is a very widely used statistical technique for estimating test error. Okay. Uh, in statistical parlance, the test error is also called generalization error, extra sample error, extra sample error to contrast it with in sample error. In in sample error, we are using the same x i, the extra sample error is an estimate. So, essentially this expectation is like saying from the underlying distribution get new x and y, many new x and y and on that sample estimate the error. So, that is why it is called extra sample error, generalization error, test error all these are same essentially the true risk of f hat. So, cross validation is a technique for estimating the test error without separately setting aside some data for testing or validation. What does cross validation do? Given the data, we choose some parameter k, we will come back later to say uh, how to choose k, k is some integer <coughs> and we divide the data, the data of n points into k parts roughly equal size if you can get them to be exactly equal size we will get exactly equal size otherwise maybe uh, one sample this one data point this way that way. So, we divide the data into k parts k is a parameter of the method uh, but to choose a k we will we'll discuss that later. But so, if, if I want to do 5 parts so um, I may have 200 samples so I put 40 samples in each part. So, I make 5 parts I, I divide the data into 5 parts. Then what do I do? Then I run the model learning algorithm k times. So, if I if I have divided my data into 5 parts, I am going to learn uh, a, a f hat 5 times. On the ith time, we use for training all parts but the ith one and essentially use the ith part to estimate error of that length model. So, if I have divided my data into 5 parts, the idea is I run the same learning algorithm on the <coughs> like this. First time, I set aside my first part, use parts 2, 3, 4, 5 for training. Then I will get uh, uh, some model. Then next time, I use parts 1, 3, 4, 5 uh, for training, set aside 2 for testing for the second time. The third time, I use parts 1, 2, 4, 5 for training and set aside the third part for testing and so on. So, we run the model learning algorithm k times. On the ith time, we use the use all parts but the ith part that is 1, 2 up to i minus 1 and i plus 1 to k for training. 
and ultimately going to use the ith part for uh, uh, testing that model. And my final error estimate is a combination of all this. So, the idea is that I am not permanently setting aside any part of the data for uh, testing, testing or validation. Essentially, using all pa all data both for training as well as testing right? it is an interesting finesse <coughs> of dividing like this and doing sequentially. So, okay, let us first set up some notation to actually write the cost relation estimate before talking about it. So, as earlier, let us say x1, y1, x2, y2, x and y n be the data points. So, we will talk about uh, these various parts. So, let us say we have we are dividing the data into 1 to k parts, data is indexed by 1 to n. So, the division is represented by a function rho. So, rho is a function that maps the data indices 1 to n to part indices 1 to k. So, rho tells you uh, which data sample is in which part. Right? What does that mean? So, x i y i the data index is i. So, it will go into the part rho of i. Right? That is how the uh, rho is defined. Rho is an index function. So, uh, if I want to know which part x i i would be, which of the k parts x i would be, I just take rho of i and that part x i would be. Okay, that is the definition of rho. Now, f hat a minus k be the model length when we leave out part k for testing and use all the other parts for training. So, f hat a minus 1 is when I use part 2, 3 up to k for training. f hat a minus 2 is the model I length when I use parts 1, 3, 4, 5, so on uh, for training and so on. So, f hat a minus k is the model length when we leave part k. So, which means what is f hat of minus rho i? Rho i is the index which specifies which part x i x i was in. So, f hat of minus rho i is the model length using a training data set which does not contain x i. Right? So, if I say f hat of minus rho i of x i, it is the prediction of a model length the prediction on x i for a model for whose which is length using training data that does not contain x i right f hat of minus rho i is a model length over a training data set that does not contain x i right i need this notation because my final error estimate is for each x i i find its error on a model which is length without using it right each x i is used exactly once for testing so I have to test each x i on a model that was learned without using x i and that can be represented under this notation as f hat of minus rho i x i because rho i is the index of the part to which x i belongs and f hat of minus k is the model length when we did not use part k, f hat of minus rho i is the model length when it did not use x i for uh, training. Okay. So, with this notation, the final cross validation error estimate which we call E of E C V is 1 by n i is equal to 1 to n L of f hat of minus rho i x i y i. Each x i is exactly once for testing, but the prediction for x i is taken from that model which did not use x i for training. Right? So, this is the basic idea of cross validation. I use each data item uh, data point once for testing and k minus 1 times for training. Right, I, I, I do it k times. So, each data point is used both for testing and training. Right? So, because uh, so I am not permanently locking up any part of the data and can get a fairly nice estimate for the error because this is different from training error because for on each x i, I am using the model that is used that is learned without using x i and hence this is likely to give me a more accurate estimate of the error. Okay. So, the final error estimate is average of errors in predicting over x i when x i is not used for training. Right? Note that we are using each data sample once for testing and k minus 1 for training. That is the whole finesse of <coughs> cross validation. We are we are not permanently setting aside uh, any part of data for uh, testing. However, to estimate the error, I am using 
of xi for testing with a model that was learnt without uh, having xi in a standing sample okay uh, that is the reason for believing that this will be a, a good estimate okay uh, when we use k parts like this is called k fold cross validation okay. so the next uh, uh, see we did not say whether this is validation error or test error as you already seen it doesn't matter uh, as a matter of fact uh, one of the most often used uh, applications of cross validation is uh, model selection so cross validation is used for model selection in the following way so for the model class specified by alpha the validation error is called ecv alpha is given by this where f at alpha is the model land from the model class alpha and f at alpha minus rho is the model land with that particular part uh, so this is how essentially i do cross validation if i want to find the best value of c uh, in my svm algorithm i make my data into five parts for example for many different values of c for each value of c i find the validation error of that value of c that alpha like this with that value of c i learn five different classifiers first time using parts 2 3 4 5 for training second time using parts 1 3 4 5 for training and so on then on each sample i use the prediction of of that model which did not use xi and that is how i get the error and that is the cross validation error for the parameter for that particular value of alpha this i do for different alpha and then <coughs> choose uh choose the alpha that has the uh, least value so essentially the alpha can be as, as we said n of number of times parameters of the model class and we can essentially tune alpha using the above arrangement so for example in most cases whenever you do empir empirical investigation of any pattern recognition algorithm this is how you choose the parameters of the algorithm this is how you choose the model class parameters you use uh, some k fold cross validation for some value of k 5 fold 10 fold cross validation okay like this so essentially very often cross validation is actually used for doing model selection like this it can also be used to estimate the final error after you learn the final classifier after you choose a particular alpha for that model class you once again run it once and that will give you the final cross validation error estimate for the final learned classifier okay so the whole idea of cross validation is i am not permanently setting aside any part of data for validation or testing i am using all parts of the data for training as well as all parts of data for testing okay that's a very interesting finesse now what value to use for k now this is not uh, very easy to say there is, uh, is this is not a uh, theoretically derivable issue it depends on the amount of data we have the complexity of the model the kind of learning algorithm using and so on basically the reason is the following given any class of models the model has specific complexity so if i have too few examples relative to the complexity i won't learn well if i have sufficiently many examples i learn well so essentially for a, for any given class of models the expected error of the learned classifier decreases with increasing sample size as we know as the sample size increases relative to which dimension uh, empirical risk is a very good uh, indicator of the true risk so we know that the expected error of the learned classifier decreases with increasing sample size so if we plot 1 minus test error that will increase with the training set size right because error decreases one this is called the learning curve so if very few samples i get very high error but as the samples go to infinity my error will be zero so this will go to one right so that is called a learning curve of course for a given problem for a given algorithm we never have the learning curve with us learning curve but uh, conceptually learning curve is a interesting thing to do so as essentially whether or not a given number of examples is adequate to learn a from a particular model class whether or not a given number of examples is learn this particular svm with this kernel function this particular neural network with this many hidden nodes this particular linear uh, model with this many parameters essentially adequacy of a given number of training samples depends on this learning curve for that problem i can we can hypothetical learning most learning curves are like this of course i put a king here not that learning curves have to have a king but they can have a king the idea is when examples are small 
ఈ చేర్చిన ఎగ్జాంపుల్ ఇంప్రూవ్ యూర్ లర్నింగ్ ఆఫ్టర్ వైల్ స్లోలీ ఇట్స్ ఎఫెక్ట్ టాపర్స్ ఆఫ్ రైట్ దిస్ ఈజ్ ఎ జనరల్ దిస్ ఎ జనరల్ బిహేవియర్ ఆఫ్ ఆల్ లర్నింగ్ ప్రాబ్లమ్స్ ఇన్ ది ఇన్ ది ఎర్లీ స్టేజెస్ వెన్ యూ హ్యావ్ వెరీ ఫ్యూ ఎగ్జాంపుల్స్ రిలేటెడ్ టు ది కాంప్లెక్స్ మోడల్ ఎవ్రీ అడిషనల్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ ఈజ్ వెరీ యూస్ఫుల్ ఇన్ రెడ్యూసింగ్ ది ఎరర్ ఆఫ్టర్ వైల్ ది ఎఫెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఎక్స్ట్రా ఎగ్జాంపుల్స్ అండ్ ఎఫెక్ట్ బికాస్ ఫర్ దిస్ మోడల్ క్లాస్ యూ దిస్ ఈజ్ ఆల్రెడీ క్లోజ్ అన్ ఆఫ్ టు ఇన్ఫినిటీ రైట్ సో అసెన్షియల్లీ ది మార్జినల్ వాల్యూ ఆఫ్ ఎక్స్ట్రా శాంపుల్స్ డిపెండ్స్ ఆన్ ది స్లోప్ ఆఫ్ ది లెర్నింగ్ కవర్ దట్ పాయింట్ రైట్ అట్ సమ్ ఇన్ ది ఇనీషియల్ పార్ట్ ది స్లోప్ ఈస్ వెరీ హై అట్ ది లార్జ్ పార్ట్ స్లోప్ ఈస్ వెరీ లో ఇన్ బిట్వీన్ ఇట్ వేరీస్ వీ డోంట్ నో ఎగ్జాక్ట్లీ హౌట్ వేరీస్ బట్ దిస్ రఫ్లీ ఏ నీ లైక్ దిస్ అన్ ఆల్ లెర్నింగ్ కవర్స్ దెల్ బీ నీ లైక్ దిస్ నా ది proper choice of k depends on how the learning curve behaves just to take one uh, simple numerical example suppose in a particular problem this near the learning curve is around 120 to 140 samples okay somewhere around there so less than about 120 samples is not certainly adequate but about 150 samples 140 samples is always adequate at with 140 samples a fairly good confidence of learning at 120 my confidence is small because that is the need and there can be a lot of difference between the conference of at 120 and 140 because the knee is in between now let's say we have 200 samples then if i do a five fold cross validation if i do five fold each each part will contain 40 samples i use four four parts for training so every time my training set size will be 160 so 160 is good enough to learn a good classifier so if i do a five fold cross validation i certainly get uh, i certainly uh would uh, my training set sizes are fine and also my test set size of 40 is also good su sufficient to give me a good estimate but suppose instead of 200 i have only 150 samples then a five fold cross validation means i'm each part will contain 30 samples so four parts will contain only 120 samples so it may not be a good enough training set size Right? On the other hand, if I do 10-fold cross-validation, then each part will contain 15 samples. I use 9 parts for training. So, my training set size will be 135, which is close enough to 140. So, uh, on the same problem, if I had only 150 samples, I may want to do 10-fold cross-validation. Now, what is, it, what is wrong in doing 10-fold cross-validation earlier? Then also, it is okay, we have 180 samples for training. There is not necessary, because what is happening is, See, the whole idea of class validation, because I am learning with different training sets, I learn sufficiently different affairs, so that the actual error I get is a true error. On different different f hat minus k's are learned here on samples, where 40 samples differ from training set to training set. Here, only 15, if I did 10-fold class validation, only 20 samples to differ from training set to training set. So, I may, I, I, I may learn uh, roughly the same classifier, so I may not get a good estimate. Okay? So, if I can give sufficient variability in the training examples, learned by different classifiers, I am likely to get a better estimate. Right? So, essentially, uh, uh, you know, if I, if I do too large, uh, 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 too many um, parts, I may get a high variance. On the other hand, if I do too small, I may not get a, a, a enough, uh, uh, <coughs> I may have to a bad bias in my estimate. Right? So, basically, uh, if I have 200 samples in this kind of problem, I can do 5-fold. If I have only 150, maybe I want to do 10-fold. Right? Uh, a rule of thumb, most often one employs either a 5 or 10-fold class validation, which is often good enough. An interesting uh, special case of class validation is what is called leave one note class validation. Where do we choose k is equal to n? Where n is the number of examples. So, I have as many parts as there are examples. That means, this example is its own part. What does that mean? Because I use k minus 1 parts for training and 1 part for testing. We train on all but one example and test on the remaining example. So, for each example, I leave one example out, train on the remaining examples and whatever I learnt on that, I test on this example. Of course, my different training sets are very close to each other. right? So, but on the other hand, I am using, uh, you know, uh, exactly uh, each example once for uh, uh, testing still on a model that is 
<coughs> land without using it. Okay. Uh, leave or not class validation, this is called leave or not class validation because every time we are leaving one example, uh, it is recommended when sample size is really low. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, though it's, it may not sound like much, if you have sufficiently many examples, leave or not class validation uh, in an expected sense gives you the true error. So, its bias is very low. But its variance can be large because you're, you know, you're doing leave or not, but its bias is small. So, the expectation of the leave or not class validation error estimate uh, would be close to the true error estimate, true risk if sample size is sufficiently large. Okay. But of course, this is also recommended if sample size is low. Uh, its main problem is it is also computationally very expensive. So, we do not want to go for it unless we really want to get this kind of an estimate because uh, you have to run your classified learning algorithm n times here any the number of examples you have. Okay. Uh, the essentially the error estimate is likely to have low bias, but may have high variance. Right? But this is one very special kind of a class validation estimate, it is called leave or not class validation estimate. Uh, very often, even when data is large, if we can do it, one does this um, to get some estimate of the expected true risk. Also, uh, is often uh, resorted to when we have uh, very small sample sizes. So, let us consider one interesting example of leave one out class validation. Let us say we are learning an optimal hyperplane using the SVM method. Okay. Uh, SVM, in SVM method, I do not have to do this learning multiple times to know what, what happens when I do when I leave one example, right. That is why we have cho chosen SVM for this example. We know that in, a, in the SVM, the hyperplane is completely specified by the support vectors. So, if we remove some of the non support vectors from data, we would still learn exactly the same hyperplane. That is the nature of the automation problem. When we, when we uh, did the theory of SVM, we saw this that the hyperplane is completely specified by the support vectors. And once having learnt it, now if we keep the support vectors and throw away some of the non support vectors from the data and relearn, resolve the automation problem, we will get exactly the same solution. Which means if I throw away some of the non support vectors, then we will still learn the same hyperplane, which means the classification of all these left out data would be same as earlier. We can use this to actually calculate what will be the leave one or class validation estimate. Suppose you will land a separating hyperplane. So, if we now remove any one of the non support vectors from the training data set, we will land exactly the same hyperplane, which means we correctly classify the removed data point. In leave one out, we are removing one x, landing f, and only on that x you are testing, and all those test errors are averaged. So, whenever I remove a non support vector, I get 0. Let us say we are doing uh, uh, 0 1 loss function. So, I get no error because I learn exactly the same hyperplane and hence it will still classify the, LA, 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 the point as earlier. So, <coughs> there is no error. On the other hand, if I remove any of the support vectors, I do not know. I may or may not learn the same hyperplane and hence I may uh, classify the left over point wrongly. So, what is the maximum error I can get? Each when when I leave out each of the support vectors, the length one may not may not classify the support vector correctly, the, the, the vector correctly. But whenever I leave out any of the non-support vectors, I'll I'll learn the same hyperplane, so my error will be zero. So which means my leave one out class violation estimate is bounded above by the fraction of support vectors. A matter of fact, when we did support vectors, we showed we stated that the expected probability of error is bounded above by the fraction of support vectors. This is essentially how it comes about. Right? So, the leave one out class violation estimate is bounded above by the fraction of support vector. That is how fraction of support vectors is a very useful quantity in SVM because it is a leave one out class violation estimate of the probability of error by the land classifier. Okay? Yeah, this is a feature that we already discussed earlier, but it is interesting to see its connection with the leave one out class violation estimate. And another method of doing uh, the similar thing of using your training data to get test error estimate is bootstrap. Bootstrap estimates provide another general method of estimating uh, test error, generalization error, uh, uh, true risk, whatever you call it. The idea in bootstrap is to generate many training sets from the given data by sampling with replacement. Sampling with replacement means I have x1 to x1. I choose a particular index randomly between 1 and n, 
put that uh, uh, data point into my uh, this training set and then generate one more index set which could be the same as what we said. So, every time I generate a number between 1 and n and that corresponding uh, data I take into my training set. So, my training set may contain the same training uh, point more than once, but by sampling with replacements like this I can generate many training sets of the same size. So, the idea is given the original data points and points we generate b number of training sets. So, first I generate n random numbers each uniform distribution between 1 and n that gives me one training data set. Once again I generate n random numbers each uniformly distributed between 1 and n that gives me one more training data set. Like this given the original data of n points we can generate any number of training sets let us say capital B is the number of training sets that we generate. The idea is then we learn a model on each of these B training sets right? and uh, the final error could be average of errors of all these models. Right? So, this is another method it is called bootstrap because it is essentially of course, the train same training data set, uh, but uh, uh, using the same training data by repeatedly sampling we are we are generating many many training data sets and learning many different models and averaging out all their errors. So, the idea is just like uh, the phrase pulling one up by one's bootstraps using the same training data we are somehow getting at the test error ok that is why it is called the bootstrap estimate. Uh, <coughs> the, the main is thing is unlike in cross validation uh, we can have as many training sets as we want all of size yeah because with sampling with replacement we can keep generating as many as you want B is at our control. See in the in the cross validation we cannot generate any more than n training data sets right I mean because I can at most put n parts I cannot divide data into more than n parts, but here I can generate as many training data sets as possible B can be anything. However, they can be very similar that we will we'll come to this later we will let on see how similar they are ok. Once again let us just uh, uh, complete the, the, the formalism. So, like earlier let us say small b denotes the index of the bootstrap uh, uh, data set or bootstrap sample that we are generating. So, the capital B number of bootstrap samples f hat small b uh, denotes the model length using the bth bootstrap sample ok. Then the final bootstrap estimate of error is I uh, will I'll first call it E 1 boot is see this 1 by n i is equal to 1 to n L of f hat b x i comma y i is the training error or is the error on the original data set not see B is not lent fully on the original data set it lent on some sample version of the original data set. So, uh, <coughs> this is the uh, the error or the uh, um, estimate of true risk of the model lent on the B th bootstrap data set right and I average it over all the B bootstrap data sets I have. So, the idea is that this is an interesting error estimate. Of course, there are two problems with this, uh, this uh, at least one problem with this error estimate. Here we are using the original data set as test data while for each b uh, f hat b is length using some of the same data right. So, essentially if I want to call this second summation as the, uh, the test error of f hat b then it is like I am using x 1 y 1 x 2 y 2 x n y n as the test error, but uh, some of these x's are used in training and hence landing a fat b. So, one does not expect this to become a very good estimate. So, this is not a good averaging. So, next class we will see a simple example of why this is not a good uh, estimate and then uh, uh, see how we can improve it and then moving on from there we are, we are learning at many classifiers that can be learned from the same training data set. We will look at how we can make such a method become very effective by learning more than one classifier. Thank you.